This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Michael Takia Magruder, who um, is going to be talking to us tonight on the subject of the aesthetic archive. Michael um, has had numerous research positions in the past, most recently with King's College on the Strand. Um, but I think first and foremost, uh, Michael is a practicing artist. And I think what's interesting about this talk is um, that artists engage with archives in lots of different ways. They often come in as, say, artists in residence, that kind of thing, might like inform, or might use the archives to inform their artistic practice in some way. And I think uh, Michael's example is a slightly different way of uh, engaging that kind of encounter between artists and archives. So I'll pass over to you. Michael. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Well, I hope you all find this this useful. It's it's certainly not an area I normally talk about because even though most of my work does deal with data, and if we're working with data, um, sort of making a slight shift to thinking about working with digital archives and collections, it's not such a great leap. Um, but as Alan said, I'm first and foremost a visual artist that just happens to be embedded within sort of the research sector. Um, in terms of my work, I'll just show you some things briefly so you can see from what perspective I, I'm going to be speaking from. Really everything that I've produced in the last 10-15 years has been computationally based, so that is to say working with data, networks, code, hardware, software, and if you take that away you, you really don't have anything. It is the you know the essence of the of the works are are based in the in the digital domain. Now of course if you think about digital art, there are things like net art, internet based art, sort of things that are purely screen based. And yes, I've I've done a, a lot of work in that space. So for organizations like Rhizome and Turbulence.org, some some of the big sort of net art portals I've done quite a bit of work for over the years. Or emerging virtual environments. Um, I might not look it, but I'm, I'm old enough to be first generation um, digital sort of uh, person where I, I grew up playing things like Pong, um, gaming, virtual reality, um, basically pre-web sort of hanging out on text-only bulletin board systems and, and things like that. Um, so a lot of my work has actually sort of gone into these emerging virtual spaces, sort of especially I'm particularly interested in shared virtual environments, so things like Second Life or the open source equivalent Open Simulator, sort of using these new new spaces too as platforms for, for artistic practice. But for as much as I do like the digital, most of what I have been doing over the last decade is really looking to get things off the screen and into a physical space. Um, whether that's sort of in a black box or different urban environments. And this is actually a good example of why I find media-based practice quite interesting, where this is a very old work, um, back 2000, 2001, where you have single channel broadcast video that is then sort of realized in a multi-channel installation and then the same thing is taken to this was less this was the first video wall in London I was invited by the advertisement company that owned it to use it for an installation so whereas the the media surface becomes the painting surface I'm getting to play with time I'm getting to play with data I'm getting to play in a public domain so on and so forth and it's the the same in a sense artistic entity sort of iterated across these these different spaces that's only possible through the media itself of course sometimes I I dip into performance I find sort of media-based practice has a lot of connections and synergy with performance um, and sort of blending virtual physical spaces and bodies working with classic architectures again sort of supplanting the digital onto the historic and the analog space. Um, and again, for working in these sorts of spaces, I mean, I think, um, uh, just as a, a little aside, people, when they often think of, say, virtual reality, um, they will think of, say, 
a modern computer-based visualization sonification systems. But if you look at the core aspects of what VR is, things like illusion, immersion, those are traditions that are long-standing traditions. You only have to look back to, say, Roman wall painting, frescoes, and in the technology of their time, it was this blended architectural, scenic, communal space realized with sort of fine paint. <laughs> but, but again, it's about sort of projecting that self. So I like to work in architectures because it's sort of working back through the, the traditions in, in history. And of course, sort of um, the white cube, because as a visual artist, that is the, the sacrosanct space and the one that I like to sort of push forward and create things that do speak in the language and the histories of painting, sculpture, photography, video installation, but augmenting it with computational media, sort of asking if we bring the computer into the conversation, what new possibilities, what new dimensions become available to work with, and through those new dimensions, what possibilities then sort of come out for us to creatively explore. And on that note, really, I, I think of myself much less as a maker of things and more as a remixer of this data culture um, in which the point of what I'm trying to do is often using art and the, the, the platform of art is, is a place where I can actually critique um, things which I think are important in, in this modern sort of data culture to be discussing and to actually involve people in the conversation, whether that's member of the publics or, or researchers and academics like yourselves. If any of you are interested, I can give you, Alan, this PDF um, where you can, you can put it online. So I just put this, if you're interested in sort of that practice, um, some of the things I've shown. I, I've, Peterborough Museum recently commissioned a, um, a monograph looking at sort of this 10-year block of my work. Um, various academic essays about the works and, and representations of the work themselves. You can there's a free copy online PDF form which you can you can download. And in terms of it's it's always weird sort of talking about things when you can, as a visual artist, it's like you want people to see them, experience them. So at Somerset House, I currently have a solo exhibition, which is a collaboration with the Theology Department of Kings and a group of creative technologists, and it's called Decoding the Apocalypse. So it looks at histories of visual arts practice based on the Book of Revelation, but it's my take in sort of a, a modern age of networks, code, and data. So when I was asked to sort of speak today, I, I you know, I thought, archives and society, it's certainly two things that I'm very interested in, and I, I do sort of see connections into my, my greater practice as, as long as we kind of frame it within the digital. Because even though, of course, I, with all my work, sort of pay homage to, to the, the history of what's come before, I, I find the digital space a very exciting space in terms of the new sort of possibilities. It opens up, and the aesthetic archive project is very indicative of that. I mean, uh, I guess, Alan, you would sort of come to our, our session, our sort of final recap session at, at, at King's, and just for other people here, what the project was is King's College has a cultural institute that has this program, it's called the Innovation Program, which what the program seeks to do is take King's academics, which I was a King's academic at the time, and link those academics to people, researchers in the cultural sector, to then look at projects that actually sort of cross that divide. And I have long worked with news media, news material, and have a number of colleagues at the BBC. One in particular, Mark Flashman, who is uh, he's no longer at the BBC, but at the time he was an operations manager at World Service sort of had been there for over 20 years, dealing a lot with archives. And he was part of a team that um, basically was responsible for creating the World Service Radio Archive prototype. And we started, he was very interested in my work, and, and we started to think about ideas like, you know, given the 
the interests of, say, artists like myself that are working in the digital space of, you know, in a sense, remixing data, recontextualizing data, making, trying to make the data visceral and experiential um, to allow different ways to get into the data, if you will. Always with the public sort of facing mindset because at the end of the day, I create experiences for people to come in and enjoy and to maybe take, hopefully take something away um, from that experience that he was very interested in sort of like thought it'd be very useful to get my sort of input into the development of this of this archive and how with the archive and the prototype they were building which was in a sense a digital interface on how someone like myself that's sort of creatively working with data might actually tweak what they were doing to create these sort of artwork we started talking about them in terms of artwork interfaces um, to allow you know a different way to explore let's explore the material so we took our ideas to the, the Cultural Institute and it went down really well and they funded us to do um, the phase one of the project, which was a scoping phase, where we would actually take their prototype, um, which was being which was already online, but it was a it was sort of a closed system. You could not it was not publicly accessible at this point and really to start building a a, a dialogue between King's Academics, um, based mostly in um, digital humanities and in CMCI, Culture Media Creative Industries, those two departments and people at BBC R&D on sort of Mark's end. So this idea of sort of all these different networks, sharing meetings, discussion sessions, where people that were working with, say, visualization, metadata, archives, asset management, you know, all these things from both sides could, could come together in a sense have, have discussions and we we soon found that there was just a lot of common ground um, but as I think with with all collaborations that end up being good it's about finding people that are thinking along similar but not too similar lines if that makes sense so just to show you a little bit about what this archive is if we're still connected so the World Service Radio Archive itself is basically the whole collection of the BBC World Service Radio's program. Um, now, of course, it, it dates back about 45, 50 years. The beginning of the archive is very sparse because, according to Mark, and, and one, you know, it, it does make sense in days of analog tape. Not a lot was saved, or things were recorded over. Um, it, it's funny, sort of, Mark was responsible, actually, for um, helping to build the archive. So it was actually quite a nice journey for him insofar as at his time at the BBC. Not only was he, he partially responsible for actually building the archive, but then when it came time to then digitize the archive and then use the archive, you know, try to use the archive in different ways, he had sort of seen that whole process. So the archive started off as a collection of about 90,000 program radio assets. And what some of the guys in BBC R&D um, were able to do is they were able to, in a sense, the first step was actually digitizing the, the, the physical archive variety of sources, different kinds of tape, different kinds of, you know, of, of course the more recent things were born digital. Um, but those were the easy things because that was just sort of unifying the assets then and putting it into a, a data store. All the older stuff had to go through the process of digitization and so on and so forth. And of course in that kind of digitization process, the building of the archive, they soon realized that, well, um, if we just have the media assets, that's going to be just really difficult to use and kind of worthless. You, <laughs> you almost... Um, without metadata, a layer of metadata, of good metadata, um, this is not going to be very useful for us. So they actually came up with a scheme um, which became, in a sense, this prototype where they started using various sort of algorithmic process and supercomputing to, to in a sense, um, go through and automatically tag using sort of speech-to-text recognition and sort of, in a sense, automated 
tagging of these 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 assets here. So let's see if I can get on one to one to show this. So uh, it says, yeah, I, I have to to sign in. Um, but basically, on each of the sort of the, the programs, you would you would see the the automatic sort of tag where the speech to text programs would go through, it would run, and then you would actually get the the automatic generation of these tags and. And that was pretty good, but again, it, it wasn't satisfying for them. So they started thinking about, okay, well, how can we improve on this? So what they started to do is they, they got the permission to open this up to researchers and other sort of interested user groups who then could go in, could actually look at what the, automa the, the automated systems had generated, and then they could refine that by their voting tags up or down. It was actually a very beautiful situation that they had created because they also were thinking along the lines of sort of linked open data. So tags had to relate to things that were in Wikipedia, um, DBpedia, um, so that you just couldn't, in a sense, make stuff up. It actually had to be something they used that as the source, so tags had to relate to that, which um, made it so when humans were actually getting in and adjusting things, putting in new tags, removing tags, that it, it, it there was, in a sense, a, a a common repository for where tags could come from and so on and so forth. So they did a lot of innovative work in this area, but one of the problems that they were having was sort of thinking about, okay, well, how can you navigate this and, and how might you actually build, build systems which can speak to members of a general public because the people that were really accessing the archive were, were, were specialists and, and, and that was only getting them so, so far. So in the conversations that we were sort of building, we, we started sort of thinking about things like this is a, a visualization by one of the, the R&D engineers, Michael Smethurst, sort of looking at um, listening concurrent, so actually tracking people's interests and sort of you know, looking at sort of clusterings of if someone is interested in this, would they also be interested in this, and sort of moving around. And sort of as an artist, I started sort of flipping it on its head. It's like, well, well, actually, if if the end goal is to, in a sense, get a good tagging of the whole archive, actually, what maybe we should be doing is the opposite. We should actually look and set up a system where it encourages to look not at <laughs> what's been listened to before, but actually listen to what is in a sense unexplored, you know, of that sort of collection because we were getting these sort of pockets of activity, but then again if our, our end desire is to, to make this sort of a comprehensive asset um, that has, that each part has had a human touch, well why don't we actually maybe take some some ideas if we if we think of sort of like serious play gameplay you know reward system or even just an aesthetic experience where actually what is highlighted is not what is sort of the obvious. It's almost like in, you know, if you think of sort of BBC News, it's, it's a very good analogy where you have on the front page, you know, top 10 stories. Well, it's almost self-selecting because everyone sort of, you know, those get put on and then people see that first. They're like, oh, this top 10 story, I'm gonna read it. Well, it's kind of a self-perpetuating truth then. And that, um, and, and that was the problem, the, the ways that they were going were sort of like, could, you know, we're going to, in a sense, um, feed into that sort of, that, that cycle. And I, I, as an artist, I was like, well, why don't we actually think about the unexplored? Why don't we actually look to highlight that, those things which nobody's looked at or, or, or the access has been, been limited and such. Another of the, the researchers there, Eve Raymond, you know, amazing programmer. Um, uh, he was very interested in sort of looking at relating the the archive data to current events and again this was something that was building that I, I had a quite a bit of interest in sort of if we think of sort of material like this um, as history and sort of of course current news current events is, is the history of the here and the now and relating the two and sort of and and also this idea of building a personalized experience so one of the things that I was trying to push is, you know, ideas of how we could actually take this large collection, but the first sort of as, as a user or as a potential user wanting to come into a collection, it's personal meeting, personalized experience becomes very important. 
or well, I, I was putting forward the idea. So this idea that we could take, say, structures like Eve was, was creating here, where it's sort of this interface between the now and then the historical, but then also build in layers of sort of personalization. So you could say, instead of things just being random, to say, okay, well, actually, what are you, you come to the archive for the first time, what are you interested in? And you put in a keyword, and whatever that happens to be, and then sort of the system sort of configures itself almost like a tree map around what you're interested in. So kind of taking Eve's idea of, and, and, but, but adding sort of personal layers onto it. So we got to a point where we, we had done our phase one. We were very pleased with the sort of the relationships that had been built across Kings and, and the BBC R&D. And we were ready to actually start creating some prototypes. And um, <laughs> around this time, um, some rights considerations came up, or what they call in here, rights considerations, which I find quite funny. Um, it's such a nice way of, of, of saying, um, and, and just highlighting here, uh, so some of the audio programs, you know, not being available because of rights considerations. Well, at the start, I, I told you so, the, the original archive was 80, 90,000 assets. Um, and here, as you can see, 50,000. Well, what had happened during the course of the, the, the project is that um, there were a few rights holders that heard about what was going on um, and said, you know, this is unacceptable. Um, we hold, you know, the rights for these materials in the archive. And it might just be like one song or one sort of radio drummer that was part of a larger program. Oh, you, you can't have that. You, you know, God forbid you, you have that online and, and people kind of rediscover who we are and the kind of work we were doing and so on and so forth. You know, as an artist, I can say I firmly believe artists and creatives need to be supported and paid for what they do. But the arguments they were putting forward were just so ridiculous. And the end result was, as many things in, in, the, in this age, where you have um, issues of copyright and ownership and, and IP, but they're based on old systems and it's not a good fit, the, the BBC legal team basically said, okay, well, this has to be removed. And then selective removal turned into what Michael Smethurst and I used to jokingly just call outright suppression. And sort of it ended up to a point where, um, where the 90,000 becomes the 50,000. And I just, I honestly, as an artist, I said, no, I'm not, not going to do anything. Um, because it, it was it was very weird and, and I have to say that it was very weird coming to speak today about something which I would love to take forward and it just wasn't possible and, and maybe maybe that ends up being the important story from this project just because you want to do something just because you can do something and just be also knowing you should be doing something um, it doesn't mean you're able to. And um, so I think on both sides, with, with the people at King's and the people at BBC R&D, that really was something that was unfortunate, but it is the way it is in the, in the, in the space right now, and it's something to, um, to think about. So, so in a sense, I kind of have told you what we were planning to do, create these artwork interfaces, and then all of a sudden the, um, <laughs> the archive itself that we spent all this time sort of working with got to a point where really morally, ethically, as an artist, I, I just didn't want to use it because I wasn't going to help sort of provide the band-aids or the things that would sort of paper over the cracks and say, yeah, this is, this is okay. Well, well, no, it's not. I mean, BBC, we, it's, it's a public service. We, we all contribute. You know, we, we pay the license fee, and I think it's it's actually quite scandalous that members of the public don't have access to this material, and that was such that was such a problem. So to kind of sort of shift, I, I guess what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about is really um, some other examples of my work, just to show, you know, 
why I would be interested, why I am interested in exploring this space and why I think it's important to explore the space. Um, the first thing is, is really talking about, you know, data itself. And what I'm often interested in, it's not about making data pretty, but it's really about sort of exploring the data and surfacing contexts um, that are, are quite interesting. So this particular piece, which I'll show, is called Dataplex Economy. And it's, it's a live data artwork that is based on the financial market in real time. And it was commissioned at the, um, by an organization in Madrid at the height of the financial crisis for a, a big show that was looking at capitalist, post-capitalist structures. And what I proposed to do was actually um, to create a cityscape, but that was based on the market itself. So what I chose to use for that cityscape was the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Now, the Dow Jones, I mean, any financial um, person working in finance would tell you that this is not a good metric to, 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 to say really anything much about the market these days. Um, but I chose it because conceptually, socially, it's kind of what most people think in the West about the market. You, you think about the Dow Jones and the companies and such. So, of course, this is using a, a code system in this case VRML, virtual reality modeling language, to take that live data and then turn it into a city. So here's the city for the here and the now, um, which isn't too bad running considering it's running on a, on a little laptop here. Now one thing to say about my approach to data and information. Um, one of the best comments that um, my colleagues in the tech sector and, and science uh, sectors often give me is they, I, I've heard many times they say, we love your work because you're very truthful to the data. Um, and I, I certainly try to be in so far as the data is never massaged or manipulated. It is what it is and it's also I try to use the language of how that data is often represented sort of from the sector it's coming from so here in this case it's financial data so things like say historic highs are in blue lows are in red current positions are the grayscale of the buildings and I should say each company is represented by a set of buildings there um, the green spikes are volumes the you you see not only today's data the, the the exact here and now but you also see ghostly traces of five days into the past much as if you were looking at a financial sort of sheet and taking that data into an experiential form a visceral form where people can actually explore the city explore the data um, while at the same time I often show the live data stream coming in. So I show the raw material because it is the same thing. It is a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. Um, but to not only show the sense of, of liveness, but also to show the transparency of the process itself. And oddly enough, the reason for doing things like this is because I think when you explore data in that kind of visual aesthetic form, um, interesting sort of points kind of, sort, of, sort of manifest. Um, one of which here is, again, this is a screenshot from the time that the exhibition was going on during the financial crisis, where you can see in the center section, there were companies that were basically going under. The banking stocks, some of the manufacturing stocks were just, the buildings were shrinking, so the size of the buildings was relation, directly proportional to the market capitalization. So that's basically the share price times the number of shares the total value that, in a sense, we as society place on that company. Um, so building size was, was basically the size of the building, the market capitalization, and the green spikes were trading volume. So you could actually, while the show was going on, when, when the banking stocks were getting hit, and, and some of them ended up being de delisted from the Dow Jones, you could actually see the building shrinking, you could see the spikes, you could see you could feel the volati volatility of the market at the time and sort of the things that were going on. Perhaps even more telling was the, the bird's eye view where people were looking at this version of the city because, you know, there in the gallery it was outlined what this was and how to, in a sense, read the piece. 
and you could see so the the city each building it's you think in terms of quadrants where each building is replicated four times um, so people were saying people were asking well what are these monolithic buildings here you know what's which you could you could see that represents about of the total Dow Jones that's about 40 to 50 percent of the entire index and I said oh yeah that's that's quite interesting that's Exxon and then all of a sudden the 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 sort of the phrase big oil kind of all of a sudden takes takes a new meaning people see it slightly differently you see it for what it is where all the other sectors are just collapsing in on themselves in Exxon you know big oil it's like the crash never happened um, if anything they probably enjoyed it and you know again I guess to, to, to make my point about what is the purpose of art you know anyone can go and sort of online and that's what you would get but would you would you pull those relationships in those contexts I mean certainly my friends in finance would but I dare say most people would not so that ends up being kind of the point of of why we work in that so if we look past data and we start looking into this idea of archives and, and why we would want to explore archives or why I would want to as an artist for me it's if we take it from the the showing context to then also looking at narrative um, because as an artist I'm, I'm very interested in narrative and to be honest I don't see the point of producing a work that is detached from narrative um, so for this particular project which is one that I was commissioned to do for the European Biennial of Contemporary Art in 2010 which was being held in in Spain that that year I was asked by the the organizers to select a topic um, that had both international and national significance and at the time we were in the you know our great war on terror and it was um, for, for me as an artist sort of working in this this uh, this space it was really there was only one topic to really choose and that was the Madrid train bombings uh, 11M because of the sort of the importance within Spain even at that time years after it happened but also within the wider context of what was sort of what was going on so the final result I just show this because again you look at it here's a picture of the the installation as it was sort of in the in the main sort of contemporary art museum in Cartagena which was one of the sister cities that the that the biennial was in and yes it's a very traditional fine art exhibition you can see prints, paintings, sculpture, um, installations, some video in there. Um, but when I say if you take away the computer, you have a room full of nothing, that certainly would have been the case. And actually, more important, if you took away the archive, which I had spent 18 months sort of constructing, uh, data, data mining sort of um, various repositories, whether they were sort of governmental media organizations or social media um, that I had sort of built this research archive and, and even sort of dipping sometimes into uh, the dark web you know kind of finding things through through sort of peer-to-peer -peer or um, yeah some of the more darker corners of the web to actually collect information stories bits about the the event from from various perspectives and such um, so the whole process was was based on this sort of collation of, of an archive that, that I created um, and certainly then sort of through that process of exploration some very interesting things emerged I mean one thing to say and the the Spanish organizers were very pleased that I was actually taking on that I had picked this for the, the subject of my project because uh, oddly enough there was so much of sort of discussion about the 11M bombings um, that should have been in the public domain that wasn't in the public domain there was a lot of contention around this and that um, yeah the public was in many ways dissatisfied it, it's sort of the way that both the government and the media organizations were sort of 
representing things or sort of the stories that they were telling and and I, I've long worked in a tradition of what one of my colleagues Alfredo Cramarotti has sort of written about where he calls aesthetic journalism sort of practice that exists somewhere between an artistic practice and a journalistic practice using the space of art as a, as a space for critiquing and maybe finding a different way to sort of discuss some of these ethical issues of our time. So in looking through this this archive that I created, I mean some things were very unsurprising. If you looked at sort of the media representation of this kind of event, it was certainly it was the death, the destruction, those sorts of images which were, you know, easy to find. Um, but then when I started looking at social media repositories like Flickr, and what was interesting if you think about Flickr is that Flickr, when the bombings happened, Flickr has only been online for maybe about a year or so. But even at that early time, you know, people were using it and also people were also adding assets, you know, much after the event, sort of going through their sort of personal photographs and, and adding that to their Flickr accounts. And, and whereas sort of the media was representing this history and the sort of the classic death destruction, sort of showing those aspects, what people were choosing to put up um, were images of the protests, the mass protests, because again, one thing that people don't realize is some of the largest sort of spontaneous mass protests, certainly in Spain and actually through the whole of the world, were actually Spain's public reaction on the protests of solidarity after these events occurred, where, you know, it was just millions of people just took to the streets. Um, so it was images of those protests and people sort of placed within those protests and then also the remembrance shrines that were sort of springing up all around Spain. And as an artist it was it was something that I was very surprised in. It was, it was a very interesting sort of point where you know media's representation of one thing and then of course people sort of desire to remember and represent something else. And like I said for, for me really it's it's about what I wanted to do with the project was not only give access to the material but also kind of show my pathways and, and sort of my own sort of personal sort of delve through the archive. Um, there was a discussion session at the biennial where someone asked <laughs> a rather kind of inane question of well you know why did you why did you speak you know why are you not trying to speak from such and such perspective and then I didn't even have to answer that someone else from the audience is like well an artist can only speak from their own perspective it's kind of a limitation of being human <laughs> which I was I was grateful for because it was one of those things like well how do I answer this and actually uh, stay polite um, so but but part of this project was really saying okay this is the journey that I've taken and and maybe this work in sort of the collection and the creation of this archive and then allowing you uh, a member of the public to sort of then start interfacing that you know maybe maybe that's in some ways useful so if you see here everything I did so my whole archive of, of photographs um, that I had collected in, in a sense and curated you know certainly you know I chose them I selected them I sent them through a, a standard algorithmic process to then sort of take them into an aesthetic form but then sort of the data you know the, the links to where you could access them yourself and this was sort of true for all the different sort of pieces in the installation and then printing them so the beginning of each day because you know tens of thousands of people came through to, to, to see the biannual so the day would start with basically um, the stewards of, of the show putting out all these photographs um, with sort of it saying there, you know, in several languages, you know, please take these. So people could actually take them, they could follow the links, they could actually see my little points of departure, and they could go and explore for themselves. And as an artist, that's what I'm interested in, really. It's about sort of, if I'm taking my own personal path through an archive, through a series of, you know, uh, that's, that's historically significant, who am I to say what journey is the right one? I can only show the journey that I've taken and allow people to maybe entry points so that they can go in um, and then take their own journey and do their own research and exploration. Another particular work, again, sort of if we think about media and, and this idea of the public facing nature of an archive, is I 
got the opportunity to do a piece, um, one of the pieces with the, the main national newspaper, La Opinion. So again, what I, what I wanted to do was actually look at this idea of media representation as opposed to society's representation or, or what individuals from, from Spain were seeking to represent. So it was your tr classic photo mosaic. It was a series of five. These, this is the first and the last one, which over time they were pr printed sequentially, one a day for a period of five days, and the five days leading to the opening of the biannual. And the blocks of the mosaic were all based on the media's representation of the image. And, and through the course of time, it then resolved this image of, well, whether it's an old woman or a child. It was actually quite unclear, and I, I like that. I, I don't even know to this day of this of this person sort of laying down again it was a it was a picture that I had found and really had moved me that I found on Flickr um, and what I did is I guess we don't really need to see it but I can show the printed forms so I had given the files over to the the media organization the, the newspaper they printed it one a day um, as full spreads and then every day I would go out into the city I'd find sort of literally a copy out of the trash pull it out of the trash mm -hmm. so kind of my my comment on sort of media consumption processing how we deal with our history our information so on and so forth mm -hmm. um, took it out of the trash brought it into the gallery framed it in a you know archive museum frame put it on the wall signed it so on and so forth um, right up till till the opening um, Again, sort of, for me, it was sort of commenting about history and how sort of history gets created about sort of ownership. Um, and, and even sort of things down to the, the final image, which is this beautiful image of this, this individual laying flowers, which now no longer exists because it's been removed from Flickr, so sort of pointing at the ephemeral nature of things. And I guess to, to end just talking about that particular work, like all things um, in that sort of very difficult sort of ethical space. I, I continuously was wondering if I should be doing this, if I was doing it right, and, and I finally felt comfortable in what I had done just a few days before the, the biennial open where I was sitting there in the gallery and putting a finishing touch on one of the, one of the works and these three workmen, Spanish workmen, sort of came in and they, I, I understand a bit of Spanish, really can't speak, and I, they were asking for white paint, to which I was able to kind of come up with the Spanish of, no, sorry, I don't have any white paint here. Well, they started looking around because things were about 70% set up, and um, they asked, they were interested, and they sort of asked if they minded if they just took some time, I was, no, no, no problem. And so they ended up staying for quite a time, and then they actually asked if I would talk with them and we had an, ended up having sort of this hour-long conversation where they were going through the different material and they were looking at and they were um, and after about an hour and a half they they took one they each took one of the publications they shook my hand and they said thank you and at that point I sort of I knew that I had gotten it right um, and it's for those sort of reasons because again it's if we're if we're thinking about archives for me the interest as an artist is really it's the histories that they contain you know these socially relevant histories that it might be in the past but they still are important to us now and through looking at the past maybe you know we can we can raise questions about our present um, so just to end with um, is I'll, I'll just show this slide. One of the, one of the the great honors that I had and I've had in the last two years is that I was actually asked to present this line of my work to the Rwanda High Commission. Um, some academics at King's working with the Aegis Trust and and the Rwandan High Commission were were looking at sort of the Rwandan genocide archive and. Um, <laughs> They asked me to come in to, to speak to the High Commission and, and say, you know, what an artist, a Western artist like myself, you know, what would be my take on the archive? What, why would someone, you know, what would someone like me might, might, might do with such a, a monumentally important archive that just, it's, you know, it is 
so important both sort of to the Rwandans, but also it, it's I, I'd say it's a very important sort of international repository. Um, again, about sort of a history that we need to not forget and we need to actually think about in a, in a certain way. So I, I started my talk by talking about a particular piece that I, I had done on the new year of the millennium. Um, it, was, it was an odd time for me personally. I, I said that I was, I was actually spent New Year's Eve sitting in the airport Birmingham International Airport waiting for relatives to arrive because um, a few days before sort of after the Christmas period um, my cousin I'm, I'm from the US but I had a cousin that was living in the UK married to a Scotsman and they had several kids they were driving back from Scotland and um, they were in a, a horrible car accident and she was killed he was in critical care and you know the children thankfully escaped but you know and so I'm I'm basically waiting in the airport to, to pick up these relatives coming coming over to sort of be with the family and console the kids and, and the husband who's just lost his, his spouse my cousin so I was I was not really in needless to say in, in, in the best of spirits or the best of moods and, and certainly I'm sitting there in the airport flipping through the paper in this case it was the times because it was just what was there sort of reading through and seeing all these sort of articles about sort of like um you know the party atmosphere and what's going to be done and this and that and sort of this this one sort of quote just sort of like how to survive tonight just just completely asinine completely moronic but everything that everyone is sort of like sort of talking about the whole paper is filled with this and then sort of Somewhere towards the back of the paper, I find this really small article which talks about how this miner that's worked all his life, um, it froze to death over the Christmas period because his wife literally could not afford a five pound electric card top up. Um, and so that just kind of stuck with me. I sort of, I left the airport picked up the but I but I kept the paper with me and I'm sitting there sort of later that night um, watching because the relatives wanted to get their mind off things and they're sort of watching the New Year's celebrations and the fireworks over sort of you know London Bridge and it was all a bit surreal and I and then at, at some point the um, the BBC commentator sort of gets on and is talking about, oh yeah, now in this part of this finale, sort of each of these fireworks, it's, you know, it's 10,000 pounds. And I'm just thinking about, you know, how many five pound electric cards is sort of getting shot up in the sky and what that says about us. And sort of, I immediately went to my studio, kind of locked myself away um, and composed this piece, which then sort of got shown various places um, and and that is what I presented to that was the first thing that I presented to the um, the High Commission because I said well I think it's it's the place of arts to actually of artists like myself to, to look at that to make these connections to look at these histories to, to look at sort of things that have happened to to delve into that that data or those archives into and to actually not tell people what to do, but say, this is something maybe you should think about. So, and to, to finish up, and again, my problems of why I didn't want to sort of paper over the cracks and the issues with the, with the BBC archive, I didn't want to add to that problem and say, oh yeah, this is okay, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll do something with your censored data, your suppressed data. Um, Mark Flashman, my colleague, who, who, who was also, you know, we were kind of presenting there, we, we had a look. Um, and of course, search results for Rwanda. We were just interested. Took the archive back in its unsuppressed form and, you know, 320 results. You know, what information might be there? What my information might be there that would be interested to the Rwanda you know, colleagues in the, in the commission that were building the archive, not as sort of directly relational, but we were, we were thinking about, okay, well, actually, this is a long history, 50 years, it's sort of, 
would you actually see sort of things or sort of glimpses in, in the program logs that would actually maybe show the sort of the context almost as a side channel of what was going on leading up to the genocide, so on and so forth. And certainly, you know, the possibilities were there, and then it was rather depressing. It's like, yeah, but then, then you know, it's not in the public domain. What a shame. What a waste. So maybe that's the story. Anyway, that's really all. Oh. <laughs>